you quickly reeled off prebiotics before, but perhaps you can remind us from a definition point of view, what does prebiotic mean? And as an umbrella term, like what, what does it actually encompass? Prebiotics are this exciting thing that you and I have been talking about for five years now, but I think that the market is starting to catch up on the, on the concept that you and I uh, introduced in episode 17. And so prebiotics, basically, if I were to use it in layman's terms, it's food for your microbiome. Um, if you're talking about uh, it from a scientific perspective, it's some sort of substrate, which basically means some sort of um, uh, compound that you are introducing to the gut that the microbes will then consume or metabolize. And in the process of doing that, they will, number one, microbes will grow stronger. So there is a change within the microbiome as a result of prebiotics. And number two, you actually will get health benefits as a result of it. So in order for something to qualify as a prebiotic, it has to impact your gut microbes and it has to impact your health in a beneficial way. You need those two things. Mm -hmm. And so where we're getting those when we're eating a diversity of plants, how do you feel about prebiotic supplements? Because that's a big category now. And if someone's in the kind of grocery store or supplement store, they're faced with a lot of different options. So do you have any advice or do you recommend a prebiotic supplement in this context of taking a course of antibiotics and how could someone kind of navigate that to, to choose one that's going to be most beneficial? I have had great experience with the use of prebiotic fiber supplements within this context and also uh, with people who have other digestive health issues such as irritable bowel syndrome, whether it be constipation or diarrhea predominant. I've had great success using um, prebiotic fiber supplements in that space. Now, let's drill down on what to look for in a prebiotic, what you want. Um, what you don't want is something that, well, first of all, it has to be prebiotic, right? So not, not all forms of fiber actually are prebiotic. So it needs to be demonstrated in a study to actually impact the microbiome and to have health benefits. So it has to be prebiotic. Um, number two, taking massive doses of a monofiber is not the approach for winning. Because again, and we, I mentioned this a moment ago, the evidence suggests that there's a certain amount of benefit that you will get once you cross a threshold. And then it's time to move on to something else because you're not going to get more benefits from hammering and pounding the exact same thing more, more, more. You just, you know, more, more, more does not translate into more in this case. You get what you get. <laughs> it's time to move on. Um, <laughs> so, and um, so I, I don't recommend that people like pound monofibers and take, you know, 10, 15 grams of whatever it may be. When you say pound a monofiber, are we talking like, like a straight up inulin or something? Yeah, exactly. And the issue, and I think inulin is bringing up a good point because inulin is prebiotic, but the issue is inulin also is extremely gas producing. It, that's because inulin is literally the definition of a fructan, which is a FODMAP. So one of the things that you can do if you want to be smart about this is think about the fact that you literally are in a state of dysbiosis. Again, you have medically induced a dysbiosis. We want to restore eubiosis. But when, you're, when you have a damaged gut, you are far more, far more likely to suffer symptoms as a result of adding fiber to your diet. So the way that we can approach this, Simon, is to choose low FODMAP forms of prebiotics. Low FODMAP forms of prebiotics are ultimately going to achieve the effect that we're looking for, support the microbes, give us the health benefits, restore the gut barrier. This is what we want, but the, but the difference being that you don't have to feel miserable and gassy and bloated and all of those things because you just added this, this prebiotic supplement. Right. So how does someone navigate that? Is that a, do they need to understand which ingredients are low FODMAP and not, or are they looking for low FODMAP? It would be clearly called out on the, on the label. It's not necessarily likely to be clearly called out. Part of this is um, understanding the individual types of fiber that exist and which ones are uh, high FODMAP versus low FODMAP. I mentioned that inulin is high FODMAP. Uh, acacia powder or partially hydrized guar gum are examples of fibers that are low FODMAP. Those are options. Okay. Now the issue here is again, those are monofibers. It's just one form of fiber. If we want something better, we want a blend. 
We want a mix. We want to be hitting multiple thresholds. And we also shouldn't just think about fiber because fiber isn't the only prebiotic. There are different types of prebiotics. Resistant starches are prebiotics. Polyphenols are prebiotics. The way that this works is when you eat a meal, most of what you consume is digested and absorbed and broken down in your small intestine. But there are these parts that will arrive into your colon intact the same way that they were when you entered, entered your stomach. And these are the prebiotics. Fiber, resistant starches, and polyphenols. Each of them in their own unique way has the ability to impact your microbiome, to support the beneficial gut bugs, and to achieve health benefits for you. Thank you.